Paddy Smith, Irish Times. Uh, Commissioner, I was very struck by that last, the, the concluding note about ever closer union. At the Rome summit that's coming up at the end of, of March, there is supposed to be a discussion about the future uh, path to, to greater integration. Um, are, are you saying that the that European Union shouldn't go down that line? Well, you have to be politically pragmatic about this matter, and you, everybody knows that there's about six, maybe more elections in the European Union this year. And to advocate uh, to our citizens at the moment that there is an appetite for a greater economic and social and environmental and all of the integration that we would, and sovereignty that we can pull together uh, for the future, I think this is not the opportune time. Uh, but uh, I, 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 maybe I will be wrong by, and proved wrong by the European uh, leaders, but I, I would expect uh, that there is a taking stock and consolidation required. Commissioner Kenny from Morning Ireland. Um, you mentioned uh, a hard border in your speech there. Uh, Theresa May and Enda Kenny have both said they're, they're against a hard border, but given that it's not their decision, it's European Union member states' decision, do you think that's still possible, Commissioner? Well, the Council of the European Union, which includes Enda Kenny, uh, will actually make this decision, 27 Prime Ministers at the end of the day, in the Council and the European Parliament. And the, the European Commission, through Mr. Barnier, uh, we are trying to do and work with the other institutions to draw up the draft document that will be put before them. Uh, I certainly note exactly what Mr. Kenny and Ms. May have been saying, and I agree with them totally, uh, that we have to acknowledge in any outcome, uh, and from their perspective, it's very important they would put forward solutions to make sure how this happens, that the legal agreement enshrined in the United Nations called the Good Friday Agreement is upheld. Uh, and that the integrated nature of the free movement of our people between the United Kingdom and Ireland, which we, we have from time memorial, continues. But you must remember that this is the first time that we will have our two countries separated in two different jurisdictions in, in terms of authorities. Ireland, Republic of Ireland, will be in the European Union. The United Kingdom will be outside. This was the first time that this will have happened. So we are no longer dealing with an Irish border with a third country. We're dealing with a European border with a third country. So we have to be mindful of that, and it's quite tricky. Uh, but I certainly have obviously met the Taoiseach today and I was speaking to him about this issue, and we fully support in every possible way whatever we can do to ensure that the, Euro the European institutions understand the importance of this and to the context of uh, any outcome of the negotiations to be able to accommodate it. It would be very helpful, of course, if Mrs May was able to back off her original proposal about leaving the customs union. Just one very quick question. The has good relationships with EU leaders. Do you think continuity is important? Do you think it's important that he sees Brexit through? Oh, I think that the Taoiseach has played a major role in the developments of the European Union uh, for the last 15 years, and I expect him in, to continue that role in various capacities in the future. Padraig Murphy, please. Padraig Murphy, a member of the Institute. Um, I'm not quite certain that uh, focusing on populism is exactly the right focus. Um, after all, populism, uh, if you look at the derivation of the word, means uh, the expression of the view of the people, which is the uh, purpose of democracy. To my mind, the real problem is not populism. The real problem is nationalism. Uh, nationalism, as uh, embodied by Marine Le Pen, um, as embodied by um, the new American president. Uh, and you could say that nationalism was really uh, the main spring behind the British decision to leave the European Union. So uh, against that background, um, I'm very much uh, along the lines of what Paddy Smith has said. Uh, I'm alarmed at the idea that we should park the idea of ever closer union Ever closer union has been the, rais the raison d'etre of the uh, European project from the very beginning. It's in all the treaties. It's striking that uh, it was uh, aimed at by uh, the British as a way of uh, dealing with what they saw as the problem. But uh, I don't, uh, I am not convinced uh, that uh, parking this idea is the solution to the problem, rather, uh, something you mentioned yourself in your presentation, that we should uh, focus on increasing our cooperation among the remaining 27 member states uh, in, in pursuit of the original uh, 
objective and ambition of the European Union. Well, I suppose I'm trying to enter in a spirit of real politique about this particular matter, and notwithstanding the fact that I might agree with your, your, your sentiment at the end, that we need to uh, you know, work closely together. Of course we do. Uh, but the reality is that if you go and advocate this policy in the French elections, in the German elections, in the Bulgarian elections, in the Dutch elections, we'll see how you get on. And we have to recognize the reality there that there's a group of people, a significant segment of the electorate in all of these countries, who actually don't agree with you or I. Uh, and therefore we have to address what are their concerns, and we have to address them well and communicate them better. Uh, we have to have a strategy. I know that Tony Brown, I see him here uh, tonight, who wrote the book about how we actually won and lost various referenda uh, over the years, what we did right and what we did wrong. Uh, I think we should give those particular ideas to others in the context of referenda as well, of course, but also in national elections, and understand that these issues are not being addressed in those countries. And, you know, until such time as we have a, a strategy that is able to uh, continue our, our leaders in particular in the member states and these countries and others are able to advocate in a more coherent and cogent and stronger way the values of the European Union and the values of why we're you know, together and why we need to be more together. That's not happening to the extent that it would at this stage and therefore in 2017 I'm saying that we should re pause and reflect and park for the moment. Uh, Frank Wall, mem member of the Institute. Um, Commissioner um, do you think that uh, the rapidity of the deepening of the European Union since the Maastricht Treaty, coupled together with the rapidity of the enlargement of the European Union, has contributed to the uh, growth of nationalism as it's currently manifested in a very anti-European way? And uh, perhaps, uh, do you, would you agree that perhaps we should have, with the benefit of hindsight, we should have hastened much more slowly in um, creating uh, the European Union that we have today. Okay. No, I think that it has been very good for the European Union, the fact that we have 28 member states. Uh, I think that the problem has arisen insofar as that we didn't bed down some of the criteria which allowed uh, member states uh, you know, to, to enter the European Union sufficiently well enough with our policies in a more co coherent and cogent way. Uh, but I, I think I would certainly wouldn't don't think the policy decision was wrong. It's just that the implementation of it could have been better. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the you know this is why this commission has said let's let's try and deepen uh, the, the policy implementation on the existing 28, 27 in the future, before we go down the road of having more members who want to join the European Union. So again, we are at a crossroads, or a, sorry, we're probably not at a crossroads, but we're at a, a pragmatic point in politics in the European Union where we have to say let's do better with bringing the people and the new member states up to a reasonable standard of living with better social and economic conditions uh, than, 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 than they have at the moment perhaps. Let's bed down the, the issues of deepening our political systems in some of those countries as well to ensure that they are in the traditional sense what we would expect here in any normal democracy. And once these issues are resolved I, then we can, we can go forward. Uh, but we have to certainly, I think, engage with every citizen in Europe better than we have been doing to show the values and the benefits of why they are actually a participant in this very important project. Alan, please. Uh, Alan Dukes, uh, a member of the Institute. Two points on may. One for the debate in Ireland. Uh, I think it's worth recalling and bringing it into public debate that one of the reasons that we joined the common market in 1973 was to, to, to get out from under the effects of a very unbalanced relationship with our nearest neighbour. Uh, I remember we had uh, Anglo-Irish free trade area agreements, I think, in 1948 and 1963. They were very, very unbalanced, very much in favour of the UK. Um, Irish agriculture in particular was a very poor client trying to get a foot into the British deficiency payments scheme, uh, not always successfully. And I remember one of the clauses in the 1963 agreement required us to use our best endeavours to export 638,000 head of live cattle a year to the UK. Not 640,000 or 700,000, but 638. We joined the EU EEC to get on more level terms with that neighbour. Now, clearly, Anglo-Irish relations today are very different from what they were 
in, in 1973. But who believes that if we were to find ourselves again outside the EU, in that kind of relationship with the UK, that it would be as benign as it has become? And I say that with no, I, I'm not making any pussy danton against anybody. Uh, I'm a quarter English, but I would not like to live in that situation again if we could avoid it. And I think that's the point we, we need to make for some of the more fanciful leavers here. Mm. Second point is about the, the, the debate on, on closer union or whatever it might be. I really think that the Commission uh, should exert itself more to get more sensible solutions to some of the major problems that we have today. I was encouraged to see Commissioner Moscovici apparently taking a, a slightly more accommodating view to Greece. For as long as we keep <coughs> foostering around with the Greek issue, we are going to feed uh, this kind of anti-European sentiment, not only in Greece, but in other countries. We've been trolling around with that problem since 2008 for nine years, and we have done everything in Greece the long, hard, painful, and unsuccessful way. It's time to get real about that and show that the, the Commission, at least, can give a lead in a more sensible solution, however disagreeable it may be to Berlin. Well, on the last point first, the strong supporters of Greece have been the European Commission. We have done everything we possibly can to try and convince the IMF that they need to back off and stop standing in the way of helping Greece even more. Because you're quite right in what you're saying, that if the Greek situation has continued to fester, then it has an impact on everybody, ultimately. Uh, and I think that uh, hopefully there will be a growing recognition of that in the next few weeks, when it's actually going to crystallize itself again. Uh, I think the Greeks have done an enormous amount of work, considering their level of administration that they have, where they've taken out 1.5% of G GDP uh, from their economy in terms of retrenchment and expenditure cuts and reforms. They've done, a, they've done a more than what was expected by anybody, I think, at the time when these proposals were made. And I think they have to be acknowledged for all of that work to expect them to do another uh, 1 or 1.5%. It's going to be a huge challenge for them, and it might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So the IMF uh, <coughs> uh, need to be coming more on board with the view that you've expressed, and which is the view of the European Commission. On the diversification from the United Kingdom, I'm glad that you were, I know that you were around at that time, Mr. Jukes, in terms of uh, the issues that you were dealing with at the time as a very important or organisation you were working for. Um, but in order to ensure that we have the least possible uh, uh, difficulty for the island of Ireland, vis-à-vis -vis UK and the European Union and trade, the government here has to put themselves in the mindset of what is best for Ireland, the UK, but also for the 26. And if you look at the figures for trade, there's a many countries in the European Union have a very substantial trade surplus with the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's in the interest of the European Union, I would say, to be looking very calmly and very benignly on a free trade agreement that would say duty-free, tariff-free uh, for all our goods and services. That would be a hell of an achievement from the point of view of Ireland and the island of Ireland vis-a-vis uh, -vis our trade with the UK and be between North and South of Ireland. But again, I would say that if, if, if Prime Minister May was able to soften her approach a little bit in the Customs Union, it would even, it would even put a little bit of a cherry on it. Uh, but we have, to, uh, we have to, I suppose, aim, as we've been saying today to the Irish government, to aim for a duty-free, tariff-free arrangement and be as near as possible to what is the situation at the moment that we have. And I think that that's well understood. I have three people that I want to pass first, and then Una, and then this gentleman in the corner, please. Uh, Philip O'Neill, Irish Farmers Journal. Uh, just following on from the last point, and Alan explained very well what the situation was like prior to Ireland joining the EU. Uh, I suppose, and the other point is, Irish farming has benefited immensely from the common agriculture policy over the decades, so okay. those things are an absolute given. Yet the reality, I suppose almost half a century on from joining, uh, the UK remains our main market for agriculture produce, particularly beef and cheese. Now, uh, you identify, and I think correctly, from a wider uh, economy perspective, the benefit of being part of the club of 450 million as, a, as opposed to the 60 million. Uh, and that's even more pertinent given just the, the comments that we heard previously there. Uh, but will the EU, or do you visualize that the EU will find a way 
to support Irish farming over and above what it does already to reflect the fact uh, of the problems of the displacement that could be caused, that is likely to be caused in the event of a hard Brexit. Thanks, Phelan. Una, could we have your question next? <clears throat> Una O'Dwyer, former Commission official and member of the Institute. Um, Commissioner, I've been hearing regularly, in, particularly in the media these days, that a little bit on the lines of what Frank has been saying, that the EU now is so wide that we don't even understand each other. I mean, saying such things as, well, what does Estonia know about our problems in Ireland with our border, our free travel area, our close relations with the UK? And by the way, what do we know about Estonia, for example, and their problems? How would you counter that sort of argument? Thank you, Chairman. Brian Keegan is my name from Chartered Accountants Ireland, and I also write for the Sunday Business Post. Um, Commissioner, I'm very taken by your comments about bolstering the image of the European Union, how important that is. But having said that, we've had uh, Commissioner Moscovici, your colleague, here in the last few weeks, suggesting that we surrender some of our tax sovereignty by way of the CCTB project. Mm. We've had uh, Commissioner Vestager, perhaps, suggesting that uh, Ireland should be more proactive in collecting what could be regarded as European tax liabilities rather than Irish tax liabilities. I'm just wondering, you know, in that kind of context, is there an argument that the Commission might be meeting us better halfway as people like ourselves are trying to promote a positive image of Europe in this country? Well, first of all, Mr. Keegan, I would say that um, Commissioner Moscovici is not trying to take over the competence, which is not his competence in relation to taxation matters. He knows the law. He's just trying to ensure that we have common ground rules in terms of calculating our tax. I think everybody will welcome that so that we won't have distortions of competition. As an accountant, I'm sure you would appreciate that. Also, Mrs. Vestiger is implementing the rules of the European Union. Uh, if you have 0.005% tax liability in a company, maybe you're you might be able to tell me more, I'm not an accountant, but it was a rather ingenious way of, uh, uh, of using the tax system for to uh, develop a case on state aid rules and, to for, and confer a distinct advantage on one or a small number of particular companies that wasn't available or known to any other company or companies. So, you know, this is about implementing state aid rules in a, in, in, in a way that is actually, you know, ensures that we have a level playing pitch for everybody and treat everybody fairly. That's what the Commission's responsibility is to do, to be treated by people fairly. Now, it might appear, because the company happens to be in Ireland, that it's been depicted perhaps as something unfair to select somebody from our country and with a huge figure like 13 billion. But I noticed that in our visit to the Oireachtas Committee, there wasn't a hell of a lot of fight back when she said that most of this money could be Irish taxpayers' money. Uh, you know, and that was her opinion. Maybe in time that wouldn't be proven to be right or wrong, but uh, we, we know that in a few years' time. People went very quiet you know, when the, the notion of 8 or 9 billion euro was going to be available, including perhaps the business post might go quiet as well. It's a lot of money. Uh, um, Una, I can't tell you how to get to know the people of Estonia or anybody else. Uh, you know, we're in this together for various reasons uh, in a club of where we have derived enormous benefits, and we can only go on what we know best in Ireland. <coughs> but when I, get, when I go around to the European Union member states, which I'm sure you have, you know, we see the enrichment uh, that we have with, with our people that can move freely, with the benefits in terms of education, mutual recognition, uh, the benefits of employment, workers' rights, environment. What it has done for the environment as a former Minister of Environment is enormous. We, and many member states, including our own, would not have done otherwise. Uh, and uh, I would think that... <coughs> There, there, there is huge positivities that we can see where people are part of the same group of people sharing uh, the continent of Europe. And uh, you know, it's up to ourselves, whatever interests we are, to get to know those interests. But you know, people are moving freely like never before, and it's wonderful to see it. And long may it continue uh, in the way it has been. Uh, I think uh, I, I think we have, we cannot put our, all our eggs in the one basket. Uh, if we have a problem now, in the UK, we have to diversify, uh, and as you know, on all the trade missions we are, we're trying to do that in Ireland and the European Union, and we help people and companies to try and do that. There is going to be a transitional period in the Irish agri-food sector to recognise the, the issues now that are before us arising from this decision of the British people, and it's a pity that we, we didn't get too, 
too far in any consultation before this happened or, a commitment, or the commitment to the referendum was given is landed on us now, so we have to deal with the, the fallout from it through no fault of our own. And agribusinesses have suffered a, a loss of 600 million euro in terms of export losses arising from sterling and other factors since the decision is made. And there's nothing that's happened yet in terms of changing the rules. So, of course, uh, Ireland will be right to put forward a special case in this respect. I don't think we should be talking about special status, but we should be talking about a good case to reflect the fact that we have a geographical area uh, which is close to our nearest neighbour, but we also have an integrated trading relationship with the United Kingdom, which has to be reflected as well, and of course the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, so we have circumstances and issues that nobody else has. But we have to put the case on the basis that it's a credible European case, not just a credible Irish case, and which resonates with the 26 other member states. Um, and if that means a, a bit of extra help along the way, I'm sure our negotiators will be fighting for that. How can the EU put together an immigration policy that takes on, I think, what is the, the raison d'etre in a way of Marine Le Pen uh, and, and many others, the, the, the Dutch and so on, and sell it to the kind of uh, to the part of the population that has been swung to that side. Anyone else that now? Well, yeah, if there's, a, if there's one other question, I'll, I'll take it. Is there anyone else? I can't see from here. Well, there, there is. Uh, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Senator Coughlin. Welcome, yeah. Commissioner. in the back door, um, I see. <laughs> we've heard some very contrary views in the recent past from the Taoiseach and Prime Minister May on the one hand that we're not going to countenance going back to anything uh, you know, that we're going to border, we're going to free movement of people and goods that we've had for, for so long. And Michel Bernier has expressed a view, I believe, last week in Brussels, that this is one of his top concerns. And yet, on the other hand, some of the hard people in Europe think this is not going to be possible. There's going to be a hard border, so to speak. Perhaps you might give us a brief overview. I know we're in advance of negotiations and all of that, and it's not possible to maybe predict, but you might give us a flavour. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. If there's no more questions, this is then going, going, okay. gone. Okay. Well, Michael, the European Commission has put forward seven proposals to deal with the immigration issue since I became Commissioner. And it was amazing that in, I think it was in July 2014, when President Juncker, as part of his ten priorities, put in one of them about for us having a, a common EU immigration policy, uh, people were wondering to know why he was putting that as one of the ten priorities. Uh, so he was quite a, it was rather a good move uh, and a, a fair recognition that he was in tune with what was happening, particularly in the Mediterranean countries, arising from displacement of people due to war and other factors, of course, in Africa. Um, so it's the member states have to make these decisions. They're not even able to make a decision about relocating or resettling a couple of hundred people in each member state from Italy and Greece. And we're expecting the Greeks and the Italians to carry all of the burden uh, for the rest of us. We're either in the club or we're not in terms of sharing some of the burden. And Ireland has been exemplary, even though we're not obliged to do anything. Ireland has been exemplary in taking a, a small number of people, a couple, few hundred people, but showing people that we're a caring country, that we care about this problem, and we want to be, act in solidarity with our, our people that are badly affected with this in Greece and Italy. I visited the, uh, uh, the southern Italy uh, not so long ago, and I was briefed on 455,000 people in Catania, in, uh, you know, in Sicily, in, the, in the southern Italy. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's in one location. So this is not sustainable, and this is only going to get worse if we don't tackle the African issue. Uh, you know, I mean, wars might stop eventually, uh, uh, you know, in Syria and in, 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 in Libya and, and, and Iraq and places like that, but the burgeoning population of one billion extra people in Africa is going to create more possible irregular migration and uh, a fight for survival to the best address in the world at this stage, the European Union. Mm. So. I would think that this is a great challenge. And I, I don't detect in many of our member states a benign attitude towards actually improving their policy out implementation. But we have to keep at it. Unless people are prepared to shoulder their fair of responsibility in a common way in the European Union, this won't be solved. And there's only a trickle coming at the moment now from Syria across to Greece, but still there's a huge number of people in camps everywhere in appalling conditions. Um, Paul, uh, a lot depends on whether Mrs. May is going to relax her position a bit on the customs union to decide whether we're going to have a hard border or a not-so-hard border. 
Uh, of course, we can. We are making proposals, uh, and the Irish government, I know from today's meeting I had with the government, that they are making proposals, of course, in line with what the Taoiseach has said, and quite rightly to put forward his view about not going back to the borders of the past. So where you put the line and the border of the next European border is important, but also where you, where you actually, um, you know, how you actually implement a border based on whether you're going to have a comprehensive free trade agreement, ultimately, uh, between the UK and the European Union, which of course will include Ireland. All of these outcomes will determine uh, whether we're going to have a reasonable outcome on the type of border arrangements. We all, as, we all hope that we can continue as closely as possible to what we have now. Uh, and that would be a great result for the island of Ireland. Uh, and there is various technologies, there's various, we don't have to have a, a border in the physical sense uh, in Carrigan Arran, near Nuri or anywhere like that we used in the past, uh, but we have to have a facility where it's a European Union border now, as well as an Irish border with Northern, a Republic of Ireland border with Northern Ireland, uh, where it's a European Union border with a third country. So it's quite complicated, and the same issues apply in the common travel area. It's the first time we, were, we had one leg in each camp. But unfortunately, we're not in the same camp anymore. And we have to reflect that, and we have to think of imaginative ways we can solve this problem. Uh, but the British have to help us, and they have, cannot walk away from the international sovereign agreement and legal agreement that they have with the Republic of Ireland as guarantors of Northern Ireland and the, the Good Friday Agreement. Well, on all our behalfs, I want to thank you very much for, firstly, a very forthright, clear and, I would say, visionary speech. And then, secondly, for the way in which you've handled a whole variety of very interesting questions. So, on all, all our behalf, thank you very much, Phil. Thank you.